Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 19 of the I Rock Knits podcast. I'm Corey Eichelberger, and I live in Victoria, Minnesota, with my husband, college aged daughter, who is coming home shortly, and my dog, Cody, the chocolate labradoodle. Uh, you can find me as I Rock Knits on Instagram and Ravelry, and um, I Rock is just Corey spelled backwards, but it is something I do in a recliner rocking chair. <laughs> So I went with it. Uh, and I would love it if you would give me a thumbs up on the podcast or subscribe. So we have a lot to go over today and I'm getting kind of a late start. Um, remember when I moved my whole schedule around so that I wouldn't have things on Mondays? And I had book club today <laughs> where we discussed the book, My Year of Living Danishly, which was quite good, very interesting. Um, kind of a light book. The uh, author was the editor of Mary Claire magazine um, in Britain um, for a while and then her husband got transferred to the, or asked to, to go work for Lego and they decided to go and give it a try and see w because Danes are considered the happiest humans on earth or something like that. That was the premise and so she does it in 12 months each chapter being one month of their time there. So it, it was good, I liked it. We didn't have a lot of time to talk about it because uh, this is the last meeting of the year for our book group and then we decide on all the books for next year so we have to kind of abbreviate. And we, we talk for a period of time, but not as long as we normally do. So um, I'm gonna say my hellos. I have a lot of them today. So more and more of you are reaching out to me and I love that because it's, just so fun to try to respond to every single comment and so far I've been able to really keep up. So hi to Kathy, Kathy Goodman, uh, Little Kitten, Andy P uh, reached out again, Chantel M, Irene of the Three Ply Podcast, which I just watched by the way. Um, those girls are, are so funny. They just have a really good rapport amongst the three of them. Um, Tamara A, Gerda, Jackie with a CQUI, and then I also have another Jackie in a minute, so I don't want to not say both of them. Jan P, Rachel W, Emma B, Bev B, Sue C, Deborah L, Norma W, Better in Popcorn. Couldn't find a name on that one, but I love that. Better in Popcorn. Evelyn B, Betty Stein, Barb C. Hi, Barb. Uh, I know Barb in real life. Helen P, Susan W. Um, Susan is loud too down just a, just a notch don't yell Corey uh, Charlene R who's in Canada and would like me to come teach I would love to do that Peg O Sarah W Jody N Deb N Peggy B Laura L Darcy C Melissa B Taylor uh, South Dakota she's the librarian that I um, went and spoke in Sioux Falls um, to about my book that I wrote and I saw her this weekend at Shepherd's Harvest which we're going to talk about um, a lot on the podcast because it was a crazy weekend. Beverly F, Mama G, Sharon S, Iroll Knits. Thank you for putting a pronunciation key on your um, Ravelry page, Iroll, because I got it now. <laughs> Knit Takes Two, Mary B. Uh, thank you to Mary B. I have a little thing to share with all of you. Mary is um, in my library knitters group, and this is what Mary writes for all of us. At last, we can all enjoy a fun wardrobe of stripes without concern. According to NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information Research, entitled Applying the Helmholtz Illustration to Fa Illusion, Illusion to Fashion, there is no evidence to support the widely held beliefs that horizontal stripes make the human form appear wider and that vertical stripes have a slimming effect. All the evidence here points in the opposite direction. Now, if science can please find a way to make me appear taller without wearing heels. I'm with you on that one, Mary. I'm a shrimp o too. I only, I only stretched about five foot three. Um, people always say to me, oh, in real life, I thought you'd be taller. It's because I'm loud. <laughs> it makes up for the little bit of shortness. Uh, Courtney L. Jackie, J-A-C-I-Q, who has reached out before. Um, Beth T, Norma B, Costa A, Coastal Ann, 54. Why do I also always say that one wrong? Wendy Y, Amanda C, Susie O. Susie, every time I look at your name on YouTube, I think you're Susie Orman, the lady who's gonna save me a whole bunch of money with my finances. Is that true? I know it's not the same, but I see your name and I think, oh. Um, you've probably heard that a hundred times before, but. I, it made me laugh. Uh, Christine B, PJ, we, PJ and I had um, 
lengthy conversations over the last couple weeks. PJ has the Knitting with Quills podcast and she's a new podcaster and she's looking for some feedback and she's a new designer who is trying to break into the design world and she is Knitting with Quills because she podcasts with the Hedgehog because she is in charge or a part of the um, Arkansas Hedgehog Rescue. So if you love little critters, she starts each um, podcast with a critter. And she just has four episodes out there, I think. So anyway, PJ, we were going back and forth quite a bit. I'm a long replier. If I have the time, I will kind of like Kathy Goodman. We like to type a little information, to use some exclamation points, parentheses, and <laughs> I like to, to get it all in there. And Eileen, she's reached out a couple of times to me. So thank you. I clap really loud there. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm gonna address the elephant in the room right here at the beginning of the um, podcast. I got a haircut. I have bangs now. So I went to my hairdresser because I've been growing my hair for a year and a half or two years because I used to wear it pixie short, pixie short, almost hairless sometimes. And I, I got really tired of getting haircuts all the time and coloring it all the time. So I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna grow it so I don't have to have my hair cut as often. You know what? You still have to have your hair cut and colored all the time. <laughs> the gray still grows out and it still gets longer. So unless you're gonna just let it grow inches and inches and inches, you still have to go in and it, it really wasn't so much about the money or the time. It was the combination of that, like the time and the money to do it. So I went in and sat in his chair I'm going to start with a Corey story right now from the top. This I did not plan this for the podcast. 30 years ago, my husband and I got married, moved to the Twin Cities, and we're looking for hair cutter. And um, we lived in a southwest suburb and in the suburb just north of us, uh, Excelsior for all those of you that are in the metro area, there was a, a hair salon. And so we got our hair cut by Todd in, at this hair salon. And Todd used to perm my hair. Um, I had long hair. I had quite long hair. I had a mullet at one time. Maybe when I met Todd, I might've had a mullet, like real long in the back and short all the way up here when I got out of college. Anyway, and I had had shorter hair um, in gymnastics when I was in college and when I got married. So I had I have a love-hate relationship with like hair and hairstyling. We moved to another suburb, kind of lost track of Todd. Um, he, he moved to a different place. And then we moved to Virginia, the state of Virginia. So I'd really lost track of him. When we moved back to Victoria, Minnesota, and it's, you know, the downtown of Victoria is four blocks. I'm, I'm in a suburb, but we have, it's a tiny town. I'm walking down the sidewalk one day and I look in these windows of like a storefront and, and one chair in from the edge, I see Todd cutting hair. I, I mean, literally it has been eight, year, eight years since I had seen him because we'd moved away and we, then we came back and I, I went running around to the front of the store and I went in and I said, is that Todd? Are you kidding me? The dog is barking and the phone is ringing hang on to that point okay I'm back I can't exactly remember where I was in my story but we're gonna pick it up just so I was walking down the street looked in the window saw Todd ran around to the front of the building and said to the lady if that's Todd Leaf I need to go back there I need to go and and say so I go walking back and he turns and he goes Corey Eichelberger <laughs> and so now I'm back with Todd to get my hair cut it was kind of like serendipitous, right? Where you had someone you really liked. Um, I have um, a story to tell you someday, which I have alluded to previously about fertility. And Todd was um, uh, went through that journey with me, um, partly because he had a wife um, in that journey um, at one time. And so uh, it he's he was a special person to me because when you spend an hour and a half in someone's chair every month. Um, you kind of get to know them, right? And you spend time talking. And and if he's the type, if they're the type of people that share, and you're an extrovert, so you talk to everybody, um, it totally makes sense, right? That you would share some things. So I uh, I got my hair cut. 
because I trust Todd, which I thought you needed to know that story. He said, it doesn't, I said, we're cutting it short. <laughs> Go to the pixie. I, I cannot do this hair anymore. I cannot dry it. And I hate the bangs because they're hanging in my face all the time. And when I walk at the dog park, they're sweating, they're hanging in my eyes. And, and he said, okay, okay. And then he went to do some color. And I said, and, and the color, my color's been too dark. I think we need to, and I was, you know, sometimes you're just in a mood. So, um, and I had canceled my appointment again. I had had two appointments. And between the time that I had canceled it and the next Wednesday, so a Friday I canceled, um, and the next Wednesday, I, I had waffled. I had waffled and was like, I don't know if I should cut it short. I spent all this time growing it out. Maybe I shouldn't cut it short. Maybe it was meant to be that I shouldn't. <laughs> it's hair, not of great importance. And he said, you don't seem 100% committed to going back to the super short. And I said, well, I, I just, um, I don't have an, a different plan. I don't have another idea. And he said, how about if we try bangs? because you're gonna cut those no matter what. Let's try bangs. So he got my bangs and then it was still pretty long here. And he said, and I said, I don't wanna dry this. So he said, let's just take it in steps. So every month or five weeks or six weeks when you come in, we'll just change it until we hit somewhere that we really like. And I thought, well, that's fun. I'm a risk taker. I, I, I don't mind really having a different haircut every six weeks until we hit, but I kind of like this for right now. It hasn't, it's a lot easier to dry. It doesn't take me nearly as long. I have a lot of hair, but it's very fine. So it holds water. It, it does not dry quickly. I can walk around the house for an hour and a half and still have damp hair for some reason. And, um, and it, it's really not that thick. So when I dry, I have to dry forever. All that to say, <laughs> I have new hair. So, and next five, six weeks from now, I might have new hair again. <laughs> so we'll just see where we go with it. Um, I will try not to touch it all the time because that drives me crazy. <laughs> um, where am I going next here? Let's go on to the um, shawl revisit, right? I decided that maybe we should name these segments, be a little more professional. It's trying to come up with something clever instead of sweater of the week, <laughs> shawl of the week. <laughs> And I decided that maybe I would go with uh, a sweater revisit and a shawl revisit because we're bringing back what once was great, right? We're things that were great, we're trying to bring them back. And I'm just using things from my class, right? So as you know, I teach these as a class and we're just going through the database kind of um, every week. I just moved down one from things that I talked about in the class. And so um, this week we're on the cinder scarf. So it's not really a shawl this week, but I like to talk about it in class because um, as if, if you've been watching for a while, you know that when I knit new things, um, when I cast something on the needle, I very rarely choose something that is uh, not going to teach me a skill, something new. I don't want to just knit a stuck in it pullover because I'm not gonna really have anything to look forward to in it. So I like to learn new things. And the reason that I love this scarf is because it's two-sided cables. And this entire scarf was made in cashmere. I had a cashmere um, blend yarn and this is the scarf that most people want to steal from my class <laughs> when they put it on. It is a bulky um, or chunky weight. So here, let me show you how you spell cinder. C-A-N-D-E-R, it's by Jared Flood. But kind of before Jared Flood was doing um, all of his own collections, this was from 2010. And it, um, it, is writ it was knit with the yarn I used. Classic Elite Yarns Ariosa with Cashmere. I'm not sure if that yarn is still available. Um, it was 87 yards to 50 grams. So it was a, you know, considered a bulky weight and 32 stitches and 16 rows in the cable pattern. So although it is a garment uh, or an accessory that doesn't have to fit, so you don't really have to get gauge, you wouldn't want something to be too loosey goosey in this gauge. So it's knit on a size 11 needle. So it works up really quickly. It would, it would make a great gift. And if you've never done double-sided cables before, it's really fun. So I'm gonna pull it apart here so you can see. 
knits and pearls, knits and pearls. So you're in ribbing for the entire uh, scarf. You start out in ribbing, knit, knit two, purl two, knit two, purl two, all the way across. And then you start crossing cables in the ribbing. And then that's what makes the back side reversible because the knits on the back side are purl and the purl on the back side are knit. So the back side of the cable is a cable on the other side with the knits and pearls reversed. S super slick. I learned this technique in a class with Lily Chin 15, 20 years ago, a long time ago, but I had never used it in application. I had never found anything to actually um, use it for. And so um, I don't know if you can see, but this one is hanging this long. And so I, the reason that I like this is because you can wear it I put it on me or put it on the mannequin? Put it on me. <laughs> you can wear it like this. You get that kind of cowl effect. You know, in your coat. I have a safety pin in here. This is, must have been when, where the tag was for the, but I don't know where the tag is. That'll help me remember to find it. Or you can wear it just slung over a shoulder and it will, it, um, it kind of stays where you put it. You know, you can do it in halfsies because it's, it's wide and it has some heft to it. So it's fairly easily styled, I would say. I hope that is not. Oh, Lord help me. <laughs> Microphone. This cashmere should not have made that go, I hope. I will listen to it in editing and hope that I didn't totally muck that up. So let me show you here. Um, it is considered uh, six inches wide and 64 inches long. The pattern is $7. It only comes in one size and um, they do recommend a cable needle um, because you've got big stitches in your crossing but you can get by without a cable needle if you choose to. So um, here it is, doubled. So I'll, I'll do it in fourths. In fourths, it doesn't quite, you know. Yeah, that's how long it is. It was a really fun net. Do I have a little end popping out there? Oh, I do. So this came in um, a multitude of um, kind of muted colors, you know, gray, uh, cream, black, and then this green, I think, was one of the, the brighter colors that it, it was available in. Um, the pattern is available in English and German, and two knitting books, Classic Elite Quick Knits and Classic Elite 9117 Alley, as well as under Jared Flood. So you can get it on Ravelry. You can do it as a just a upload um, right on Ravelry. But it's called Cinder, and if you do it up in a, in a bulky weight yarn, of course we learned last week, right, that you can knit it by holding yarns doubled and then sticking it through the size 11 hole in your needle gauge to see if you're at gauge with holding something double or even triple that you already have in your stash. So you could use up, you know, worsted or air and weight yarn um, by holding something together. So that is Cinder, and that is our scarf revisit. <laughs> Somebody come up with a really clever name for this as opposed to what I'm using. Over time, I'll probably change it quite a bit. Okay, so um, what am I wearing today is the Lady Kina. This is a yoked construction with pleats. And the beauty of this, that sometimes when you do a um, sweater that has one button at the top and then is open, the um, it, can't close in the front because the circumference at the top is the same as the circumference at the bottom or similarly speaking and if you go out at all which most people do because this will go out over your bust um, it can't close in the front but because this has all of the gathers that are going on there then it closes really easily in the front so if I stand up a little bit it, it closes right down the front I knit mine in a kind of a linen um, mix so it's it's great for summer and i wore this to book club today and i sat next to my friend barbara hi barbara and she said those are corgis you know 
<laughs> and she has a corgi and uh, my nephew has a corgi and I wouldn't have recognized it as a corgi. I had no idea. Can you guys see it? They're going to be upside down. See how cute they are? A oh, little pink one. The sweater is not really red nor pink. Um, it's not, it's kind of in between and I was looking for something to put on under it. So I picked the corgis apparently, me and the queen. So that's what I'm wearing today. Lady K-I-N-A. Um, the sweaters of the day today. I have, um, I've knit this a number of times and a lot of you will recognize it. This is a uh, sweater revisit number one, one a pattern once that was once great. This is the February Lady Sweater by Pamela Wynn. And it's free. That's why 13,000 people <laughs> have knitted and put projects on Ravelry, which means probably 20,000, I mean, I would say, I, I would like to know the statistics on that. How many of you out there knit patterns and never put them on Ravelry as compared to people who knit patterns and always put them on Ravelry, right? Is it half, is it 50%, is it 75% people don't do it? Because then the numbers on Ravelry are completely skewed, right? Because if you read 5,000 people knit it, but actually 15,000 people knit it, that makes, you know, that really makes a huge difference. So 13,000 some people have made this um, pattern and it's a great beginner pattern. I do recommend it for beginners. It really teaches you a lot about raglan shaping, shaping a sweater. It's got three quarter length sleeves, although you can make them longer. And there's a whole list of modifications that we're gonna talk about on, out on the Ravelry board. So this is a worsted weight sweater. And there are, um, you know, yarn ideas at the top. So you can go out and look and see what worsted weight yarns people have used for this. It was originally um, published in, uh, as a baby sweater by Elizabeth Zimmerman. And that's why it's free from Pamela because she sized it up. So she took the baby sweater and made it an adult sweater. And this is the uh, description of the sweater. A swingy lace cardigan made to fit a grown ass woman, lovingly based on Elizabeth Zimmern's classic baby sweater on two needles from Knitter's Almanac. And I always read that in my sweater class and it always makes me laugh. Because if you have not grown your ass, you should not knit this sweater. <laughs> because it's only for grown ass women. Like who puts that in a description, <laughs> right? I love it though. I just think, okay. I'm not trying to offend anyone, but I think it's funny. <laughs> Only if you've already spent some time growing yours. <laughs> Whoops, don't touch the table today, Corey. I have a note right here. It says, don't jiggle the table. I'm getting an iPad. Um, it's, it's an investment, but something that will hold my iPad from a distance up high so that it's not on the table anymore so that I can still have stuff spread out here because I don't have anything to hold it up this high. So I had to spend some time on Amazon <laughs> trying to figure out what would be tall enough and have enough of an arm to hold my iPad in the center of the table. And I don't want to move. I've already moved all my yarn into the dining room. <laughs> all right. So the February lady is knit at a gauge of 18 stitches to four inches in garter stitch on a US size eight knitting needle. It is written for sizes 35, 37 and a half, 41, 44, 49 and a half, and 52 and a half. So it goes up um, pretty, pretty well there. Um, it is translated in Danish, French, German, Icelandic, Italian, Mandarin, Portuguese, Spanish, and Swedish. So broad language variation there, which I just think is am um, amazing. Um, what else am I not telling you? It came out May of 2008, so it's, it's been out for a long time. Um, I, I think that um, her pattern, uh, it, her pattern is um, very well written. You're doing um, increases and decreases uh, um, for the sleeves and at the, the raglan. So that's about all you really have to know uh, other than that this, this lace pattern, which would be yarn overs and knit two togethers. So if you're a newer knitter, um, those are the skills that you would need to have to knit this. Uh, I love raglans. They fit me really well. I'm doing a little um, write-up on some raglan information, and I've been doing some research on 
I'm trying to pull together uh, some articles on what type of yoke or raglan or set in sleeve or drop sleeve fit different body types and I found some articles out there but this is some information for you on raglans okay um, most women benefit from the narrowing as we were bigger in the bust than we are in the shoulders so if it gets narrower um, from the bust to the shoulder. Now the raglan is interesting because it requires cones to work together, the front, the back, and the sleeves one and two. So you've got these sections, triangles, or cones. The way these cones are worked, joined and shaped, can differ greatly from one design to the next, but the basic effect is a tailored fit with a sporty look. Where things become problematic is in people with unusual body proportions. Large bust, fleshy arms, narrow shoulders. Raglans could be weird on you. Petite or very tall, could be weird. Fleshy arms but average otherwise, trouble. The reason unusual proportions cause trouble is that the four cones of the raglan have to be worked over the same number of rows with the same number of de decreases along the armholes, matching one by one across the seams. So there's not a good way to fix that if you have those things. You can fix it, it's just not as easy to fix it. If you need to work larger sleeves because of your arm size and then work the same rows and decreases as the body, you will end up with far too much fabric at the top of the sleeve, which creates a deeper neck on the raglan, which will change the whole look and fit of the sweater. If you need to change the depth of the yoke because of your height, you will interfere with the number of rows and the rate of shaping. These are not insurmountable problems, they just require some modification. I recommend the raglan for people with normal or average proportions. And for women who don't mind reworking their patterns a bit, I would not aim for a highly customized fit in a raglan, but you can certainly get a more body conscious fit in a raglan than you would a drop shoulder. On the pattern page, Pamela Wynn has written down questions about this pattern. A knitter generated list of common modifications to this pattern can be found in the wiki tab at the top of the page. So I clicked on that and went there and there is a page and a little bit of, mo of modifications that people made to make this sweater fit better for them. And I'm just gonna kind of, you're, you're all big boys and girls, you can go out and read yourself um, and you know see what this goes, because you can go to the Ravelry page, February Lady, and then click on the modifications um, and, and read this whole thing yourself if you're thinking about knitting this. When in doubt, size down, big bold print. When choosing a size to knit, go with the size that is closest to your own measurements without going over. This is important because one, the sweater will grow, and two, the yoke looks best with a bit of negative ease. So as long as your bust is bigger than your waist, a smaller size is going to fit and flatter you best. And that's where this comes in, right here, right? This being able to close in the front if you're waist is significantly bigger than your bust, this is going to hang open, right? So you want to know what your circumferences are here to be able to modify for that. Stop the garter step section above your breasts. So here, I wanna make sure this is back because I did stop mine. It's probably stretched a little because I knit this 100 years ago. So here, you don't want it to be at the apex, right, of, your, of the widest part of your bust, that line. You wouldn't want that there. If you're a busty lass, oh, that's a nice way of putting it, your first instinct might be to lengthen the garter section to cover your breasts. Before you do this, you might check out the project photos and see which look you prefer, garter stitch stopping above or below the bust. And this is true for a lot of sweaters. You don't have to want to knit the February Lady for these rules to apply about raglans or for you know anything that has a pattern in it on the front of a sweater. Measure your arms. If you're, the finished sleeve measurements are too big for your arms, see the sleeve mods below and then swatch. And stretch out your swatch a bit when blocking to give you an idea of how the sweater will grow, will grow with washing and weight and time. Okay, and then there are sleeve mods. A lot of people did sleeve mods on this sweater. I believe I might have because the sleeves can be a bit of a bell shape and, and depending on where they hit you, you might want to narrow those by knitting two together, you know, and slip slip knitting underneath the arm coming down if you want that to be a narrower 
circumference as you come um, down the sleeve. So there's a, a mod on to just decrease the overall circumference of the sleeves. And then there's an, a mod for to eliminate the belling or the flare. You can do more one or two more of the following, okay? So that's out there for you. And any sweater that has three quarter length sleeve that is wider than you would like it, you could go and use these mods, as well as the yoke. Here are the, the highlighted modifications for the yoke. Increase evenly over a row. So there's a, a um, fantastic cal cal calculator on a website for you to, to do your increases evenly. Change the fit of the yoke omit the eyelet increases and instead continue raglan increases. So if you don't like these here, if you don't like the holes, you don't have to do yarn overs. You can do uh, make one, uh, you could do a knit front back um, so that those were closed up if you don't like the look of that. The reason that I really like it for a beginner is that when you're doing a raglan, you're, in, you're starting at the neck and you're increasing in four places here and here in the back in here so it's really visual when you lay it out for someone who has never done a raglan before to say see you're increasing front on you know here and here you're increasing here and here so eight times uh, and it's just visual it's kind of like when you're doing a sock um, heel flap turn and gusset and when you finally like you're, you're knitting it and you're not real sure where it's going and then you can kind of lay it out and you can kind of see the whole thing and how it works. That's what I really like about it for beginners is that you really get to see how the raglan works. You can switch up your increase methods. So they've got options there. You can raise the back of the neck there. Are, you can add some short rows at the back if you've got um, issues with your uh, sweaters riding up in the back, which most of us do, right? Like. Um, th that's a whole design <laughs> thing. Uh, you can customize the neck no, opening. If you're thinking that it will be too big or if it stretches out too much, you can use a provisional cast on and then once you finish the neck, you can go back and pick that up and knit it up so that it's the exact size you want it. I mean, they're just really great tips on this sweater and that's why I really wanted to, uh, that's why I keep it in my sweater class um, because I can tell you things um, a few things on each sweater, but when there's a sweater that has a ton of things that you could learn from, uh, that's a nice option of a sweater to knit. Okay, you can add a button band overlap. So the pattern is written to open up and fly away a little bit. That's the way it's supposed to be. And it opens just below the buttons. Um, but if you'd like it to overlap all the way down, you can add extra stitches to the front so you can make that work for you. Um, also, you can add a collar. So it's a Madden style collar and it's really cool and you can go to a tutorial um, to see how to do that and see pictures of it as well. So Pamela has done, for a free pattern, she has done you a great service to help you with all different kinds of modifications to make this sweater your own and to make it, make it really fit. I'm gonna show it um, some pictures here. Here it is on a pregnant woman. And here it is on two other women. Long sleeve, she made hers completely long sleeve. But see, they're still wide. These two are shorter. Hers are elbow, hers are like three quarter. So lots of options. The other thing that I like about this sweater for a beginner is if you've done a lot of knitting and purling, a lot of stockinette and that's your favorite thing, or garter, <laughs> this is a really nice um, pattern. Uh, lace pattern, it's not uh, too difficult, and it stacks on itself. So when you're doing it, and you see that the the decreases all happen right here, for that, you can stack them. And then it's, it's easy to know whether or not you've gotten off or you make a mistake. Um, and I'm pretty sure that the lace was um, pattern on the front side, pearl back on the back side because you know, you're going back and forth on this one. This is not worked in the round, it's open at the top um, and you're working back and forth uh, in garter stitch and lace, which means that you're, um, you're not always knitting all of that. Now, this sweater is when I tell a joke in, <laughs> in my class. This is a great sweater if you have a sports team to support. 
because it works up quickly, doesn't have fully long sleeved, it's not super long, um, it's on a, a pretty open gauge for this lace part. And if you have a sports team, you can purchase variegated yarn, even from the big box stores, um, in the uh, school colors of your choice, the football team of your choice, the hockey team of your choice, you can get the variegated yarns in the blue and the white and the red and the white or the green and the yellow or the purple and the yellow, whatever your colors are. And so this, I don't know if the colors are really showing up, is my University of Minnesota, Minnesota Viking sweater all in one. <laughs> Cause I'm not gonna knit both of those babies. So this has maroon and gold and purple and gold in it. <laughs> so if I go to a sporting event, then I wear it both ways. It swings both ways. <laughs> there we go. So it has maroon and purple. The buttons look really purple. They're not, they kind of change with the, but we've got maroon here and then a little bit of purple and then this kind of gold. And so I wear a gold or purple uh, turtleneck or mock turtleneck underneath it when I go to some type of an event that I want to kind of show my spirit or my uh, true colors and it's a great one. And I've had, after my class, I've had a number of people say, that was perfect. I wore it, I knit it and I wore it to every basketball game the whole season because I didn't want to wear a t-shirt that had the school thing on it or a jersey, right? There are some of us out there that just don't want to wear um, t-shirts and jerseys and that kind of sporting paraphernalia that other people you know love to wear and so this is a really nice option because most people I think would say to themselves I'm not knitting a sweater to wear to a game but with this one it works up fairly quickly you could definitely make the sleeve shorter and then wear something underneath it so you could actually make you know make this a complete short sleeved shirt to be or sweater be no reason that you couldn't and if you don't want to do the lace, if that would make it faster for you, you could do that whole thing and stock a net. And then have yourself a themed <laughs> uh, team sweater. So I, I really enjoyed knitting this. I, my mom has one. Um, I think my sister-in-law has one. I've knit the baby one. That was fun. I liked, I enjoyed knitting the baby one. Uh, and then I have two. And I, I, wear, I get this out every fall because it reminds me of you know, pumpkins and the harvest, and it's got a wonderful depth of color. It stands up pretty well to a variegated yarn. I wouldn't say that this is the, the prettiest way to do your lace in a highly variegated yarn like this, but when I saw this yarn, I knew exactly what it would, you know, what it would work for. So um, there you go, the February lady and the cinder scarf and um, Lady Kina. Okay, I have one little tip for you this week, uh, just that I'm gonna sneak in here. I had to change out my uh, spring and summer closet to some with some fall and winter stuff because I have a lot of turtlenecks. When you live in, in Minnesota, you can have a lot of turtlenecks. <laughs> and so I needed to switch things out. And about every year or two, well, maybe every two years, when I do that, one of the ways in which I um, Marie Kondo clean out, make room for more, uh, change things around, check out my closet, is that I turn all my hangers around backwards in the closet so that the hooks are this way instead of this way as I hang them all up. I just turn them all around. Then at the end of a season or a year from now, anything that's not turned around and hung back up plainly, this going this way, means I haven't worn it. Because what I was finding is that because I saw things in my closet all the time, it felt like they were being worn. Like this shirt, right? Like I would see it and I would be like, oh yeah. And I'd go through, you know, you've got whatever, 15, 20, 30 shirts, t-shirts, whatever. And you see them all the time. So you feel like you're wearing them. But what I would, was finding is that I had a lot of things at the end of the season that I'd never worn and things that I'd worn repeatedly. And so it's hard to know what to get rid of and what not to get rid of if you're not aware of how little you're wearing it. So if you turn all your hangers around, it takes about five minutes, just you know, switch everything around so that the hangers are backwards. You do have to take them off backwards, but then when you hang stuff back up, it makes it really visual. My, my husband does it too now with his dress shirts and at the end of a season or two or three, he can just say, gosh, these are all still hanging the wrong way, which means I haven't worn them in two or three years. They feel like I know them and that I might've had them on, 
but it's just a, a little tip that I thought I'd, I'd give you. It's an easy way to kind of clean closets this time of year. We're spring going into summer. It might work better for you in the fall. So put a note in your phone that says, turn your hangers around on your closet, in your closet. That's what I did. I have a note in my phone <laughs> says, turn your hangers around in your closet so that I remember to do it the next time I switch my closets out. And so then I did it. I hope that helps. I went ahead and drew for the March, April, I Rock Knits Designs Cal winner. And that's a $25 gift certificate from Etsy. And that is going to number three. I had uh, put in the random num number generator and it is Freddie Betty. And you knit a fiber friend shawl that was really pretty. And so you won the $25 gift certificate. So when you see this on um, YouTube, then just send me a note on Ravelry to tell me your email address that you would like that gift certificate sent to and I will get it out I have to now you. put up the thread for the May June I Rock Knits Designs Cal and one person needs to move theirs over and I, I messaged you on Ravelry um, but if you knit anything in the next two months or finish anything that you've had started this whole year or you haven't posted something that you've already knit of mine feel free to throw it in there um, in that June, May, June thread because I do it every two months and I draw for a winner of $25 gift certificate. So thanks for participating if you did so. Hey, we have a question from someone this week and I'm going to try to answer it. I answered it for her already. Um, this is Jill and she writes, question, how do you know if there's enough yardage for project and swatch? Pattern calls for 1200 yards. Should I have more than 1200 yards to account for a swatch? Thank you, Jill. And I answered, Jill, there is no right answer for this question. <laughs> I felt kind of bad because I thought about it and I was like, yes, designers will always include swatching in their yardage. But we know that's not true, right? This is an unruled business uh, um, adventure when you're working with designers who come from all walks of life, different countries, um, different parts of the United States. There is no there is no standard. There is no standard. Um, there are a few rules that most designers follow, like a size range. Um, like most people who are going to design um, socks are going to do a sixty four stitch, and you know, and it may be a sixty, a sixty eight, and a seventy two, right? Because that's mostly what people will knit. Um, but toe up, top down, you can do whatever. As far as swatching and sweaters go, I don't know um, of designer that doesn't kind of expect you to do swatching. So they would include some overage in their yardage requirement. What I found when I was designing um, and asking around when I first started and we were you know, writing the book and we were trying to figure out what would be a consistent value for Megan and I, we mostly heard from people that they up their numbers by 10 to 15%. So if I knit a pattern, takes me 1100 yards to knit it, then I'm gonna up that by 10 to 15% and then I'm gonna check with all my test knitters. Which is the, the nice thing if you have one test knitter and they knit the same as you, you're gonna be consistent. But the bad thing is, you are probably not getting a true representation of what it takes to knit that pattern. And then um, if you have a number of test knitters, you probably would get a better idea of if there are gonna be variations in the yardage, even if they're getting gauge. Because we know, right, that needle, needle gauge, needle size, needle material can all change our gauge by a tad. And so, and then, the whole row gauge thing can be very interesting because I can tell you to knit for six inches or to your desired length and you're going to knit to five inches because it's good otherwise it'll be too long for you so you're going to have extra yarn and then the next person's going to come along and say well it says knit to six but I need six and a half so did the designer in Current, did she tell you to knit it to your desired length and then include that extra yardage for you? No, probably not. So what I told Jill was <laughs> most of the time they've, they've, used the, they've, they've used the idea that you are going to swatch 
you're going to be able to knit your uh, project with a standard swatch size. But there are some designers out there who want you to make your swatch this big. They want it to be eight and a half by 11, they want you to wash it and they want you to hang it, you know, to get to dry in order to get whether or not it will sag, add length to whatever you're knitting. If you're, if you're a designer that's expecting a gauge swatch that's this big, I'm not sure that you have included that entirely in your yardage requirement. But here's the scoop, right? If you need to use your gauge swatch, you can always rip it out and you know, rinse it, dry it, and reuse it. And you can sometimes, depending on how long prior you made the gauge swatch, you can just knit right out of the gauge swatch if you don't mind kinky yarn because you're going to wash your garment anyway. So my answer is still um, wishy-washy, <laughs> still hedging my bets a little here um, that most designers would allow for some overage. I, I would say I don't hear it as often now, but I always used to hear when I was a younger knitter, buy an extra skein always buy an extra skein. The yarn store owners would say that, knitters would say that. Um, there would never be a time when someone wouldn't tell you. However, I feel like that was also before there was as much indie dyed yarn out there. And so we weren't purchasing skeins that were $28 to buy an extra, right? It, there's nothing worse than running out. So my theory is when I buy a sweater's quantity, I kind of know what my yardage, you know, there are um, charts out there for you. I, I should um, bring one. Um, there are charts that will tell you how much yardage to choose. So I went and grabbed these um, out of my notebook. You can get a chart for how much yardage it will take you to make all the things you want to make. So if you want to make a hat out of worsted weight yarn, this is by the yarn weights um, at like a big box store um, where the little number is on a skein of yarn, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, this one goes for um, the gauge, so baby weight, fingering, sport, DK, and then it gives you your chest size. So it's a little more accurate by chest size from uh, chest 34, uh, 34 inches, to 38, uh, 40, 42, 44, and 44, 46, 48. I don't know if it went up higher than that because that just included mine, so it might not have gone up any higher. So the first one I got off of Lion Brand, um, this one I think maybe was on webs or yarn.com. And then this one is from Interweave. And this has um, information for babies, toddlers, children, misses for a longer loose fitting and then men's so that would be a good um thing to compare it to so if you're looking at a sweater pattern and you you know um, what yarn you're going to use and you also know um what chest circumference you're going to knit then you could compare it with one of these charts and see if they've included like wow oh there's like 200 extra yards there or some such number then you would know that you would have enough to do the swatch i hope that helps jill i i wrote you a, <laughs> a little long diatribe about you know my thoughts on that um for people uh, i would not say that i add an additional amount on top of my 10 to 15 percent um for a sweater quantity but okay, I have one more question to answer here quickly. Belly Dancing 2 says, what inspires me when I design a sweater? Well, everything, uh, lots of things inspire me. I wanted to be a knitwear designer for a long time before I designed knitwear. And um, I'll tell you a little secret. It's kind of one of those um, self-fulfilling prophecy things. I wrote knitwear designer on forms before I became a knitwear designer. So if someone asked me what my occupation was when I went to the doctor, um, the, a, a year before I really got the gumption up to do it, I started writing knitwear designer on my forms. I, I just, that's what I wanted to try to do. And I thought if I don't say it, I can't, you know, become it. So I wrote it down because then I would feel like if I never did it, I was kind of lying. So here's my notebook, and this is how I 
These are, this is my sweater design inspiration notebook. I don't know that I can show you a ton of this because, but it, it will give you an idea of, of how, how I kind of keep my designs. If I see things that I like, I take pictures of them and print them out. If I see, uh, you know, a sweater in a, in a magazine or in a, a book or at a store, if I like a striping or a shoulder seam, I take pictures on my phone of things all the time. And this entire notebook, if I see a stitch pattern that I like somewhere, I also have my sizing charts and stuff in here. But I, if I see stuff on Instagram that I think um, is interesting, I wanna look up that designer uh, or see where they're going with their career or what they've, where their inspiration comes from, I just have, I could go on forever. This notebook is heavy and, oh, this is a friend. Renee, that's you, that's your shoulder. She wore that to knitting and I loved it. And I took a picture of it and it wasn't handmade. Um, so I, I, I stopped a girl at a party and said, can I take a picture of the lace inset on the side of your sweater? Like I see it everywhere I am, all the time. I, this was at Rhinebeck, a woman was sitting on the floor like I, yeah, I, I just, I, I would, I can never design, I have three of these. <laughs> there is so much in my world and it's not just colors or nature. Like I see something and I say to myself, I would love to replicate that. I would like to figure out how that works. I would like to put my spin on that. I would never take someone else's design idea and and go with it. Um, someone wore this hat to knitting this winter. It was a store-bought hat, but there are some neat motifs in there that I might use. Um, the, the rule of thumb is, is that you have to change 30% of the pattern in order to make it your own. I don't think that's enough. It really, um, it really bothers me when I see um, things out there. There's currently a sweater pattern out there that looks just like something. I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> this was in church. I took a picture. I just thought it was really interesting. So like I have been looking and seeing that world forever. I, um, I wouldn't say that uh, every one of those pictures could become a perfect design. I would I just say that if I, if someone contacts me and says, um, you know, will you design something? I don't have a lack of uh, ideas. I don't have to sit down and go, what am I gonna do? I just start looking through my notebook until I see, say, okay, this is, this is what it is. She also wanted to know if I had um, fails and disappointments. Constantly. I would say that in the last three years, I have not near, been able to knit nearly as much as I used to knit. I spend a lot of time uh, knitting and ripping and knitting and ripping. And so I, I don't have the production that I used to have uh, as far as getting things done for myself. And yet I still continue to buy yarn. Like I'm going to get that stuff all knit. Um, but oh, absolutely. I've definitely had some <laughs> fails and disappointments. Um, not everything that I've designed do I think is perfect, <laughs> for sure. I, I'm still learning and, and, you know, things that I designed three years ago, I might do a little differently now. I mean, I usually, if, if someone finds an error or an improvement, I would certainly make the change in the pattern and do an update. Uh, but uh, yeah, disappointments, <laughs> there are many. Um, one, of the, one of the hardest things in the, um, for me as a designer, and I think for you as a knitter, I, I would assume for all of you, is that there's new stuff coming out all the time, constantly. And so you, you don't have time to knit it. You, you can't ever, you can rarely be on trend unless you're not sleeping. <laughs> Because you can't, you can't see a sweater on Ravelry or Instagram today and have it knit because six new sweaters are gonna come out in the next week that you might also like. I mean, you can only fall in love with one every so often, right? If you fall in love with all of them, you can cue them, that's fast. 
you can put them in your you could buy them that's fast um, I think we should all collect all the patterns I might edit that whole thing out <laughs> you know it, it is just part of of the industry is that I can put out a new pattern tomorrow and luckily or not luckily three other designers might have uh, the same you know if I put out a hat what happens if three other designers put a hat out on the same day? How was one going to rise to the top? I mean, you have to have a huge following or, um, or you just have to be really lucky that people look at it and they go, oh, I love that one. And then it stays with them. Tomorrow it's not replaced by, oh gosh, I like that too. Even if it's the same um, designer and you love all their stuff, there's no way you can possibly knit. Well, there are a couple of you out there who knit everything by a particular designer and I just bow to that. Man, that's crazy. The, everything they put out, you know. Some of some people are knitting their way through Stephen West, right? And some people are knitting their way through Hohi. And that's uh, amazing that they would... And uh, Christy Glass is trying to knit her way through Caitlin Hunter's... You know, I, that's just uh, crazy that you can you can knit that, that much and wear that much. I mean, I've knit a lot, but it's been over, um, you know... I need to touch on that. I was just going to say, I'm old. I don't think that I'm old. I just joke that I'm old. So some of you reached out and said that you're older than me. And I was certainly not saying that you're old. I knit with women from 40 to 88. And I feel like we're all the same age. <laughs> right? I just know that when I look back at my life, the 60s seemed like they were far away. And when I look back at my life, 1986 when I started knitting seems like a long way away. So I just make fun of it. It's it's a little flippant and maybe a little irreverent. So, but I I don't sit around thinking that I'm that I'm getting old. And the other thing is, I'm not going to name any names here, but there are a lot of you out there that don't know how old you are. <laughs> just like me. <laughs> I had a number of you, you know, let me know that you have misstated your age repeatedly or your husband has reminded you, or your, uh, you've had to do a little calculation to remember how old you are. Thank you so much for joining my club. You didn't even know that was a club, but it is now, so thank you for that. Okay, I'm gonna end today here with a little uh, recap of Shepherd's Harvest, uh, which happened this weekend, and a Cory story. Uh, I had um, seven or eight people at my house on Friday night where we knit until I think finally Amber and Matt and I went to bed about 1.30. Um, yeah, and then we got up on Saturday morning and we headed to Shepherd's Harvest. So people had come in on Friday. Shepherd's Harvest is mostly a Saturday and Sunday event. Um, there are all kinds of pictures out on Instagram. If you have never seen it, there is a um, Ravelry group too uh, for Shepherd's Harvest. It happens uh, Mother's Day weekend every year in Minnesota. It's also fishing opener, so it's kind of a crazy, crazy weekend to have a big event like that. But there are three barns, long metal sheds on concrete that are filled with vendors. And it used to be a wool festival, um, fiber, wool, animals, sheep, alpaca, llama, rabbit, and now it has started in the last, oh, you know, many years, uh, it has started to become a yarn and wool festival. So you used to go and it felt really um, organic and wooly and farm heavy. And now about half of the booths. You can still buy a rabbit. We saw a woman buying an Angora rabbit. And they spin off the rabbits while you're there. Um, the 4-H has, you know, stuff going on. Um, one year they had bunny rabbit races. Um, and there are animal barns. Um, there's a, a kind of a food row of, I don't know, it's not huge. But we, we're starting to call it mid, um, Rhinebeck Midwest. We want it to become a thing. We want it to grow. There are There's space. There's tons of space. There's outdoor space. Uh, there's a whole other barn that they do demos in now, but it's not nearly full. Um, and so we go, you can do the barns pretty easily in a half a day. You know, you can go up, there's two aisles in each barn when you enter. You can go down the, you know, one side and up the other. And, and they're pretty full. The, they have, they, they do have plenty of room. Uh, it's, it's very light. It is a concrete floor, so it, it does get 
chilly if it's cold in the morning, which it was on Saturday. It was windy on Saturday. Um, the sun was out intermittently, and we did sit outside and have our lunch, and we did watch a sheep shearing. I have video of quite a bit of this that I'm going to put at the end today. I couldn't decide if I should put it at the end and put it or put it in a different video. Um, but I'm just gonna stick it at the end today so that you can all see it. So what, a year or two ago, Amber had decided that she, um, we hadn't seen each other and she was willing to drive up here. Um, so she came, um, she drove, she's 10 hours from me. So it's a pretty big commitment for her to drive up here. But we have a friend in um, Wisconsin, hi Jenny, and um, she could stop there on her way up or on her way back if she wanted to. And then our friend Stacy, who lives in Nashville, uh, last year decided to come and then came back this year. So she drives from Nashville to Amber's and then Amber drives up here. So for Stacy's 15 hours away. But Stacy is an amazing knitter. She is one of my test and sample knitters and she's one of the fastest knitters I know. And I don't mean fast in like flying fingers. She's fast in that way, but she is also just committed to getting knitting done. So she will sit down and stay seated and continue to knit. And when we were walking, she was knitting on socks. Like she, that's how you get a lot of knitting done fast also, right? Is just being committed to not like being tired and setting it in your lap and going, okay, I'm just gonna watch this next half hour sitcom and not knit a stitch, right? I mean, that's, you don't get knitting done that way. You have to keep the needles up and keep them clicking. So, and she's really technically good. Um, she's a great test knitter. She catches lots of little things. And so um, I love her dearly. Uh, so she came and then um, I have a couple people from my knitting group who came out and then we all drove together over on Saturday um, Josh Brown from Dairyland Knits came and he stayed with my friend Renee who lives in my town and um, and we headed over and then uh, we just spent the day shopping. We sit and knit. Um, you know, there are um, musicians playing at, at several of the locations who have like ch chairs and last year they had benches, but uh, and, and we shop. Um, I would say the big name yarn companies that are there as far as like indie dyes are leading men fiber arts sun valley fibers mode knit lavender loon um oh, i'm missing some i know but but um you get an idea um this there are a couple of discount yarn people usually there who have bought like fire sale yarn lots and they have big boxes and bags um of yarn that they've kind of kitted up or put into bags that you can buy at discount so, uh, and then we headed um, out to dinner. So we ate in Stillwater on Saturday night. We ate downtown at a Cantina. I can't think of the first name of it. It is excellent. If you are in the Northeast area of the Twin Cities, right on Main Street, um, right up, just up from the lift bridge, like a block up and a tiny bit over, delicious. Really good food, um, kind of. And a little upscale on the inside. It was really modern, felt newly renovated or renewed, tin ceiling painted, um, kind of some uh, fancy cocktail fun things to try. Um, we had, they had a specialty rice bowl uh, that was delicious with Wagyu beef and um, corn and beans. Um, somebody had a quesadilla, they had, you know, tacos. They had burrito bowls. It, it, I, I highly recommend it. I think everyone at our table would have gone back. So we went out to dinner with Leading Men Fiber Arts. My friend Renee wasn't feeling well, so she went home early with another, uh, another friend. Um, and so we sat there for quite a while. We had a great waitress, so the service was superb. Um, and then we came back to my house and we all knit and even the people who live in town stay stay at my house because when you start knitting and you get up you know it starts to get later and later and later it stinks that you have to be the one that has to get up and go home so they just start they just stay now so we all crash and um we sleep in because we stay up late and nobody has to set an alarm in the morning and <laughs> And then Matt told Stacy about the world's largest candy shop in Minnesota. 
And Stacy was like, what? And he showed her on his phone and then she's like, I have to go there. And I was like, well, it's not that far from my house. So it's about 13 miles south of me. It's on 169 if you're from the Minnesota area. We ran into a number of people on Sunday that we told that we had gone that there that are from here who have never been there. I was like, how can you go up and down 169 and not have gone to the world's largest candy s store? It's um, on an apple orchard that's owned by a family that used to have a, like a roadside stand. And they had apples and they'd sell apple pie and then they'd also have candy. And then it got a little bit bigger and then it became like a destination in the fall. And then they put, you know, the pumpkins and the scarecrow patch and then more people would stop. So now they have a large building that they have probably, I think, added onto twice. Last year they added this kind of half silo on the end where they painted the dome. So I have video of a lot of that at the end where I just kind of walked up and down the aisles to kind of show you things. They have all the childhood, your childhood candy, all your favorites. It, you walk and you're like, oh, I remember that from my candy. Oh, from my childhood, from my candy. I remember that. Oh, I remember that. So they have, yeah. It's what, and then they have a light on the front of the building. So if they're baking fresh pies, if they're hot, the light is on, like, you know, the donut places. And so they had apple pie, peach pie, caramel apple pie, um, apple crisp. And the apples aren't even in season. They had some apples available. They have the, a gigantic soda selection. So if you are a soda connoisseur, like you like, grape soda, root beer, orange soda, all those. And then they've got the Japanese label sodas and you know, the Stewart's, they have all the flavors of the sodas. You can buy it by the bottle or by the case. They have jigsaw puzzles everywhere on, on the bottom of every row and on the top of every row. They have jigsaw puzzles to buy. Um, you know, things like um, candy cigarettes and Laffy Taffy and uh, every kind of, um, jellied candy, salt water taffies, all the flavors, and then mixed ones and big bags and individual. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so we spent an hour <laughs> at the candy store and then we headed back across the city and went back over to uh, Shepherd's Harvest again. We wouldn't had to have gone back for, the, for another day. We had seen most of what we wanted to see and most of us were out of money. Um, but Stacy and Amber head home from there because it's an hour that way. And so we went back over and then we ran into a whole bunch of people. And so if you saw us there and said hello, especially those of you who are walking by and then you look and you see Amber and you go, oh, that's Amber, that's the Iron Order. That, that is a super fun moment. <laughs> I love watching that. She brings joy to people's lives. She's always so gracious. She's, you know, and I always say, would you like to take a picture? And they always look at me like, oh no, you know, I wouldn't want to pop. And I say, she'll take a picture with you. <laughs> and people are always so happy to do that. And um, so we, you know, we talk to people and, and they have their pictures taken. And yeah, it's a fun day. Um, Stephen B was there. He's got a big booth on one end. Um, you can buy a spinning wheel there. You can buy a quilt rack, beautiful wooden quilt racks. They sure sheep on and off all day. Um, and we always eat at the Euro. <laughs> Euro place, they have original euros and chicken euros and they're delicious. The pitas are really good. It's a Greek family, I think, really good. Um, but they have, there's, you know, people selling um, hamburgers and, and there's a deep fried apple pie place with, you know, ice cream and deep fried pumpkin pies. <laughs> You could just eat your way through that little row outside there, but I took pictures of that too. So uh, what happened to me the Corey stories for this week was we were in Stillwater and when we came out of the cantina that we had eaten at, um, we decided, Matt said, should we go for ice cream or is that, you know, this is Saturday night so we've not gone to the candy place yet. And Matt said, I thought I saw a candy and ice cream store. So I said, oh, okay. And then I think someone said that it's Candyland right there. So we headed that way. It was probably a block up. and. So we're walking and um, Matt says, uh, that I don't think this place has ice cream. So we all go, we all go trekking in and it was a fudge store, it was not an ice cream store. But we, when we came out, there was this Peanuts character. So this is on my Instagram feed, so it's gonna be, it's gonna have my little promote thing because I'm a business, but. So here's, 
Linus with his blanket. He's got chocolate stains on his lip. He's holding a bunch of candy. Um, it says famous since 1932. Um, and he was standing there and we were all like, well, where's the ice cream? Where's the ice cream? So we came out and we're standing on the sidewalk and we could go walking by peanuts and I said, when we come back, I should have my picture. Somebody should have their picture taken with him or we should take a picture of that. That's really cute. And Steve said, I'll take your picture. Um, just get back there. Well, let me show you if you can see here without, <laughs> there's a fence next to the peanuts character because there's a parking lot um, so that people don't drive out of the parking lot onto the sidewalk. So there's this fence, see that fence right there? And there's about this much space between the Peanuts character and the fence. About this much space. And visually, I was like, maybe I could fit through there. And I tried and I couldn't. And I was like, well, that's kind of disappointing. <laughs> I couldn't get through there. It, it was about this, it wasn't very big. But between, he was holding his cookie platter and then the fence, there was a space underneath. So I said to myself, I'll just duck under that, right? I can go, I don't have to go all the way down around the fence and into that parking lot to get to the other side of the Peanuts character. Everyone wants to have their picture taken with Peanuts character, right? So why would they keep, make it hard to, <laughs> to get to? So this is picture, well, there were several pictures on Steve's camera that he could blackmail me with, let's be perfectly honest over time. But this is <laughs> the picture of the moment when I got stuck. It wasn't a matter of proportion, although I have a large hind end in that picture. It was the backpack. I got a new backpack to go to this festival and I had purchased yarn and stuck it in that backpack. And so my backpack, of course it was the backpack, Corey. The backpack got stuck on the cookie tray. <laughs> And Matt, I'm saying, you're gonna have to help me. And he's like, I am not touching your hind end. He didn't say that out loud, but I'm sure he was thinking, no, it's your backpack, let me help your backpack. L little did I think in my head before I did this, I'm going to squat down and waddle like a duck with a new knee replacement. And therein also lied a problem. I can't squat down and waddle anywhere like a duck anymore. And so by dipping down that far, I bent my knee further than it could be bent without me being able to, <laughs> to, to move it. Seven people are standing on the street laughing. I get the giggle so bad I can't move and Matt is stuck behind me going, what am I supposed to do with this? So. Here's Matt over here on the edge, wiping the tears because he's laughing so hard. And there I am sitting on the edge of the thing because I haven't gotten up yet, but my face is so red because I cannot laugh any harder than I'm laughing at that moment because I needed to take my heavier than I would like body since my knee replacement through a hole that might or might not be too small to take picture, my picture next to a candy-laden statue that I probably <laughs> shouldn't even be in the candy store. The situations I get myself into, I mean, I, I, it, and no one was on the other side of the fence to help me up because no one, no one has, had gone down and actually, they were all halfway up the street because they <laughs> couldn't believe that I had yeah, how'd you hurt yourself? I didn't hurt myself. Oh, I got stuck on a Peanuts character. <laughs> kind of embarrassing. So I did eventually get my picture taken with the Peanuts character. Isn't he cute? But there's kind of enough room right there for me to just walk right through. Okay. That took a little longer than I probably needed it to, but. <laughs> In the moment, it didn't seem like it was gonna be that hard. And again, 
when you're almost 60 years old, you probably shouldn't be squatting down and waddling like a duck. <laughs> okay. I have no idea. I have stopped this several times because of interruptions and I just don't know how long it's, how this editing's gonna go, but as always, thank you so much for taking the time to come and watch me yammer on about sweaters and scarves and stories because you have a hundred podcasts to watch. I just found a couple more new ones that I'd never seen before and they have lots of, you know, lots of episodes out there and I think, how can you watch them all? There's so much to watch. So the fact that you, you know, take an hour of your week every two weeks to sit down with me, just, it means a lot. And um, until next time, keep it colorful. A Friday night at Corey's house before Shepherd's Harvest. What a way to spend the night. Oh, there's Code. And there's Mayor. Entrance. Barns, barns. Now we're getting food area way over there. That other side got shearing and other barns. Ah, there's our favorite Amber. Okay, this is food truck kind of row here. And then there's building D, C, nice and slow porta potties. But they also have an indoor bathroom here. Uh, B, and then there's building A down there. Okay, I'm here at Shepherd's Harvest with Corey. And I found the most amazing thing. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what booth it is, but Corey made me Wooly remember. Bully. Wooly, Wooly Bully. Wooly Bully, lady. Are you ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hang it in my downstairs entryway and then all the people that come to my house can think about how weird I am because it's fabulous. I'll, I'll go in. Isn't it cute? Look how far he, he stood off yeah, the He looks like he's coming off the entire <laughs> back there. And he was only $25, which I feel like is the deal of Shepherd's Harvest. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Just preached. Stephen B. Booth. Stephen made me do it. But now, look at this fabulous man. And look at his fur. I saw the text didn't go through. Say hello! Meet Mr. Tiggy Winkle. Gentle, he's pokey. Okay, Amber's gonna be. Brave. There's Amber's gonna be brave, and he'll he'll make her jump a little. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> come here, come say hi. Someday I think she plans to print that. Has she ever considered at least starting to post things? <laughs> okay, I'm showing you Ogle Designs. They have all the sports teams colors. There, I think they're out of Vikings, we just discovered. But here's their sign, way up there. And then look at these. Aren't they stunning? They're divided into two, so you can make uh, worst of weight socks that match. Oh, so pretty, of course. I love that one. Orange and raspberry side by side. Gold, blue, red. Okay, now we're gonna go over here. Look at these. Kits, minis. And here are their sock, sock sets. To get a matching, you can make fingerless mitts. all of them oh my goodness there's so many look there's even more it's utopia they're out of 
Viraqua, I think it's called. They had a flood this spring in their shop. The entire flop, shop flooded. And they have a stunning um, palette. I would call it jewel tones. Look at that all the way down. Oh, that light is coming in and it's making it not look as pretty as it is. Let me walk over here. See, look at those. Look at that tonal, those tonal colors. Just stunning. There's the purple for you purple lovers and the green. Look at this sweater. And it's just a, you know, metal shed. And then I'm the basket lady. I'm gonna show you. There's the other end. And there are three of these. So two aisles in each barn and you can go up and down uh, three barns. There's quite a bit of handmade stuff here that you can purchase already knit. You can get socks and mittens and hats here. But then look at this. Okay, I showed you the prettiest booth. This is the best of the day. In Minnesota, everything is on a stick at the state fair. This is a scrubby on a stick. I know, they sell the hilarious. You make it out of that, you knit or crochet. Okay, this is the knit shop at Rocking Horse Farm. It's near St. Cloud, Minnesota. They are a machine knitting shop, but they also have yarn and other things. This is the scrubby shop, but look at what they do. No place like home. And that is knit on a knitting machine. Purple, paisley, the dove. apple pie, uh, egg roll on a stick, gyro, kettle corn, fudge. I gotta find Back here up high, I'll walk that way. We've got all the taffies that you could ever dream of. Over there we have more saltwater taffies, jigsaw puzzles on the wall. 
and it's hard to believe that all these people are here on Mother's Day with all these children. Here, I've got Giant Batman, Superman, Catwoman, Pie, peach, apple, caramel apple, apple cookies, frozen pies, fudge, all the flavors of Rice Krispie Bars. Knitter's problems when you get home from a knitting retreat and the yarn doesn't get out of the car. <laughs> the project. <gasps> Where's the project? Oh, it's not here. Oh my, oh, it's way in the back seat. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs>